First and foremost, I want to say that this style of content creation is far more difficult than I ever could have imagined. Sitting in front of the red light, conveying a narrative to unknown faces can be intimidating. That being said, I've grown a whole new respect for the creators that make this sort of media. In fact, I realized to be successful as this type of content creator requires certain intangibles, charisma, talent, and a bit of luck. John Swan has all of these qualities and has proven that when you ride the lightning and find the perfect storm, anything is possible, even reaching levels of success no one could have imagined. But what happens when the mass slips and the world sees you for who you really are? Can anyone, even John Swan, with all of his attributes, survive that type of exposure? The story of John's rise starts at the tail end of 2018, when John would reach out to a prominent and popular channel, Turkey Tom. As Tom stated in his video, The Ballad of John Swan, John requested that Tom take a look at his content, claiming he was a fan and wanted the critique. Tom would go on to state that he saw something impressive about the early Swan work comparing it more to a Netflix documentary with its style, pacing, and delivery, and less to the current up-and-coming commentators, which at the time were equivalent to 12-year-olds rambling with piss-poor audio and backed by incoherent nonsense. John was indeed different, and the others began to take notice. Channels like Corwit and Lieutenant Cobra took a liking to John, and these three became fast friends being seen cohorting and mingling in their social media platforms. But it was the business relationships that really started to elevate the status of John Swan. The Right Opinion, a respected and popular channel known for his ability to avoid the drama but still produce quality content. He allowed John to do voice work on his Onision video, which brought more notoriety to John's name. And in a stroke of genius, John realized that casting a larger net to other communities would only be beneficial. He enlisted the help of the Minecraft creator Dream, one of the most recognizable and notable faces. He assisted John in his Minecraft documentary, which expanded John's visibility. All this would pale in comparison to what would happen next. In April of 2020, John would set his sights on Suzy Lou. Suzy Lou, a reaction channel known for the notorious actions of using others' content for her own personal gain, but more offensively known for using DMCA takedowns of any videos that did not place her in the highest regard. This no fly zone did not deter John Swan, and he piloted forward with his expose. You see, others had spoken to all the issues and malice of Susie Liu, but to this point, no one had done it in the way John had. He gave the viewer a nice package using that John Swan formula no one could match. Sadly, as expected, Susie Liu would strike and take down this piece of John's work. Little did she know, she had fallen into John's trap. John was able to take what had happened and create a second video showing others that he would not be deterred. Fans began to sympathize and root for John, the man who would not stay silent, a fighter of truth and freedom to speak. This act of defiance would not go unrewarded. As in only a few months, John's 10K sub channel would grow to a monstrous 100K. All this, and John was not quite finished. Chris Hansen, better known from his Dateline NBC program to catch a predator, had come to YouTube to bring his style of journalism and interview technique to the platform. It was believed that Chris had come with the best intentions, but this is YouTube 
and as we all know, nothing is truly what it seems. Chris, as I stated, brought his narrative of catching monsters to the platform. But as he progressed, people started to notice inconsistencies in the good guy rhetoric. Instances of video takedowns and smearing the reputations of detractors of his work were being noticed. But more alarming was his poor handling of the evidence in the Onision case. This poor behavior had built and fans required a vindicator. This is when our feathered foul of a superhero arrived. John had taken note of the ongoing situation and in true John Swan fashion produced content calling out the would-be YouTube interloper. These videos would receive praise. John had stood up to the more recognizable Hanson and walked away clean. Or so he had thought. It would be around this time that the nefarious actions would come to light. Allegedly, an individual of Chris Hansen's entourage, a staff member, began to harass and in an act I can only describe as cowardice, doxed John's family. Chris, to my understanding, coincidentally, had no direct dealing with the action and could claim plausible deniability. For me, this action in doing my research was deplorable. And if it was the end of Artel, it would have been understandable. Truthfully, it is one thing to have to deal with the ridicule from fans, peers, but when your loved ones are dragged into the light, that is not something I will ever condone. This was the point that would define John Swan. This would be John's greatest moment. He would not run out of fear. He would stand strong in defiance and continue to speak his truth, carrying the banner of honesty for all that supported him. John knew that his supporters and fans wanted to reach him on a higher level. And thus, John created a secondary channel where he could communicate directly to those who praised him. Along with his lucrative Twitter account, John had become more accessible than ever to his flock. John was soaring high and the world was truly his for the taking. But as every content creator knows, you are only as good as your next video. This time, John would look to his past to attempt to elevate his future. John would reach out to his old friend Corwitt and the two would begin work on an expose of the popular Minecraft content creator dream. Yes, the same dream that once assisted John with voice commentary for his Minecraft documentary, which had almost reached a million views by this time. You see, Dream had gotten himself into a bit of a controversy, being implicated in the scandal of cheating while performing a speedrun in Minecraft itself. I'll be honest with you, I was shocked when I reached this part of my investigation. It is my opinion that this was not the right move especially when the subject of the controversy was someone who had aided you in the past. But I suppose that is my way of thinking and not John's. John and Corwitt would begin work on their expose, occasionally dropping tidbits of information on Twitter. One such bit of info was released February 14th, 2021, and stated, holy shit, Dream is like an actual douchebag, LMAO. This tweet was accompanied by a video clip from the scuffed podcast featuring panel member Moist Critical stating that Dream had an ego and always knew he was going to blow up. That up and comers should be super confident to the point of arrogance. I was just saying, I, I didn't, I thought Kai didn't believe he had an ego. I was just going to say, because I went on a podcast with him and he was telling this story about like, he always knew he was going to blow up and his advice to up and comers was to be super confident to the point of arrogance. This video went far in making Dream look egotistical. This also had a reaction from Dream that was unexpected. Shortly after the initial tweet, Dream would take to Reddit where he would make the claim that John was not the good guy everybody believed him to be. Dream would go on to tell the situation back to when John had interviewed him, as well as speaking about a moment when John trolled a fan changing his Discord profile and using racial slurs, as well as speaking of sexual content that was inappropriate. John had to defend his honor and credibility. He went to Twitter to rebuttal the alleged 
incident. Not saying that the incident did not happen, but saying he was not involved. Instead, John's telling would place an autistic 12-year-old family friend at the keyboard when John had forgotten to log off. After this, the battle lines had been drawn and both sides began to feud over the validity of the claims. Dream insisted that the verbiage used resembled that of John. John created a massive document proclaiming his innocence until proven guilty. It was also during this time that fellow commentators such as Augie, Boblax, and Nicholas DiOrio, as well as many others, joined the fray. Many of John's peers and friends weaponizing themselves and their collective audiences to fight on John's behalf. Sadly, some of them arguing amongst each other. It was around this time that one Turkey Tom was waiting and watching during his own personal hiatus, dealing with his controversies. Tom, the man that John Swan had reached out to so long ago, was now going over the situation. Tom would state in his video he did not believe John, noting the inconsistencies in John's narrative. Tom would go on to question the lexicon similarities to John and the chat thread in the timeline. The timeline not being consistent with the creation of the account in question, as well as the use of Breaking Bad iconography, and it's similar to that of John's closest friend, Lieutenant Cobra. This coincidence continued to build until Tom would message Lieutenant Cobra. It was you. Tom would also admit that he almost believed Lieutenant Cobra as they discussed the situation. But regardless, he brought his findings to his mutual friends in the commentary community. The majority of those who received this info thought he had merit, but were unwilling to commit to it being the death nail in the case. Not long after, Tom would enter a call with friends. He was approached by a content creator of high standing, someone with no reason to falsify evidence. This individual provided testimony that John had been lying, but also had screenshots to implicate. Tom would relay this information back to the individuals he had spoken with, namely Nicholas DiOrio. And this act would seal the fate of John Swan. DiOrio would reach out to John in what is now known as The Call. During this conversation, DiOrio calmly states he has information and all he wants is the truth. An honest answer from the man he fought for, someone he respected, but more importantly, someone he considered a friend. John simply stated the now infamous line, if you know, you know. If you know the answer, then you know the answer. So you did it. That's what I'm gonna say. I, I, I... John, come on, I'm not... No, I'm not, I don't know, who knows? If you know the answer, you know the answer, that's all. Are you like the slightest bit worried? No, not really. I listened to this interaction and I found myself saddened. I'll be honest. I started this research not being a fan of John, but in doing my digging, I began to see the charm and wit. I was aware of the ultimate outcome, but in listening to the audio, you can feel Diorio's crushing realization that he was not speaking to the hero of their community. No, he has put his faith in a charlatan, a snake that had disguised himself and infiltrated their nest. Listening to John's almost held back tone, you can almost visualize the smirk on his face. The so-called hero oozing this aura of arrogance. It was at this moment I remembered the tweet. A tweet from John that would make me realize everything. I am uncancelable. I must preface this by saying I've waited to speak on this subject because though it coincides with the timeline of events, I feel this is far more severe. Pie Man was a 15 year old boy at the time. And as many were, he was a massive fan of John Swan. Pie Man was flirtatious with a 12 year old girl and John was made aware of it. John and his following began to call this 15-year-old boy a pedophile. 
This continued on Twitter until John took his tweets down. A fellow commentator, Willie Mack, would message John praising him for taking these down. And John would respond he had only taken them down due to someone flagging him. John would continue this rhetoric, eventually going into a stream being held by Pie Man, insisting he needed to get help and leave the internet. If you legitimately feel this way, and I'm not going to ask you to respond or, or say if you do or not, right? But if you legitimately feel this way, you need some help, right? You need to go off, you need to log off, you need to like leave online settings because you cannot have a public platform at, when you've admitted to this stuff. And this stuff is going to haunt you now, forever. I must admit, I was disturbed by what I was watching. This was not the heroic defender from before. This was a man taking the power given to him by his legions and punching down on a defenseless fan. I would be mortified but what, by what was to come next. Pie Man, as many would know, was quite socially awkward. And the internet, for lack of a better term, was his safe space. After all that had transpired, Pie Man made the statement, I'm just going to upload my next video and kill myself. Luckily, Pie Man's family did step in, and he was able to get the help he needed. I wish I could say that this was the end of this, but again, I can't. For you see, John was not done. John would do a live stream where he would claim he was trying to help Pie Man. That he had a good take. I continue to watch this thinking to myself, shut up, John. Just stop before this gets worse. And you know what? It got worse. John would claim that the fact that Pie Man didn't kill himself meant he was suicide baiting. But at the end of the document, he said, I might just upload my next video and then fucking kill myself. And I'm just... It came out later. Okay, well, he didn't... He wasn't... He, those weren't genuine. That wasn't a, a genuine thing. He, like, literally, like, turned around and said he's fine. Um, so he tried to weaponize a suicide attempt to try and to try and make us feel bad. I was livid. What kind of monster is this? The callous lack of empathy for another life, my God. I stepped away from my researching for a bit. But when I, when I, when I returned, I saw that John would tweet stating that he had apologized. He and Pie Man were good. Though I was still disgusted, I felt, well, perhaps he made the right decision. I was wrong. Willie Mack, the channel that I had reached, that reached out to John earlier for his original tweets, would interview Pie Man, where it would come out that John had fabricated the apology, simply stating to Pie Man, perhaps he had come on a little too hard, but he stood by his original opinion. the Pie Man situation, the Dream situation, John would delete his Twitter and leave social media, or so he would say. For four months, John would sporadically log in and out, argue with people, delete his tweets, rinse and repeat, culminating in a very disgusting self-indulgent video in which he claimed to have left and done some real soul searching, claiming he needed to come back to the platform for his fans. This confused me because in the same video, he claimed that this was his job and he needed people to watch his content for viewership and support. The once polarizing figure, the purveyor of truth and exposer of lies was humbled and reduced to nothing more than a bottom feeding e-beggar. Remember, this is how I make money. This is my job. I make videos to get views and those views generate ad revenue. And that ad revenue, 55% of that comes to me, 45% to YouTube. That's how I make money. I would love to just make videos for fun and not have to worry about ad revenue, not have to worry about views, but I do worry about it um, because it's my job and it's my job to worry about it. This was just desserts for John Swan. 
He had everything in his hands and squandered it all because of ego and false bravado and a desire to seem superior to those around him. Technicals is a channel that started predominantly in the Smash community. With his comedic style and his I give no fucks about your feelings attitude, he became a pariah in his community. But then things would change. Technicals would drop the Sky House video in which he brings to light many falsehoods as they pertain to Sky Williams and the situations that he has faced. Technicals would do a follow-up to this video involving the Smash player Zero. It was during this time that Technicals would reach out to the fallen hero, John Swan, offering to help him reclaim his former glory. Air. Fuck yeah. How does John Swan get involved with Technicals? I, he was... I was like actually supporting this dude. I was like checking up on his mental health what? because he went yeah, he went through like so much shit. And I was like, well, you Self -imposed. didn't like self-imposed shit. Yes. I was like I told him, I was like, dude, you did not like have sex with a kid, man. You can come back like Turkey Tom. You just need to do it smart cuz how what you're doing right now is not smart. Um and like I gave him opportunity. I worked with him. I gave him opportunities to like uh help me out because I could see everyone else kind of didn't fucking like him anymore or didn't like want to even touch him. So, so he, you, he you did the guy at the time of day where everybody else had fucking wrote him off. Yeah. He was doing the right thing. And I Technicals would see receive great success from these videos. Many would go so far as to say he vindicated and saved the careers, if not lives of these individuals involved. But with success often comes controversy. Shortly after Technicals began to receive backlash for his work, some going so far as to question his motives and claim that Technicals was supporting a monster with his Zero video. Technicals, in my opinion, was able to defend for the most part and convince those who disagreed with his stance of what he was trying to accomplish. It was then that the unexpected happened. John Swan returned, attacking the work that Technicals had done. Yes, the content that John himself assisted on. John tried to make claims that Technicals had a personal stake in these videos, even went so low as to attack Technicals' family. I found this confusing. I mean, we are talking about the John, the same John whose family was attacked allegedly by staff of Chris Hansen. John attacking technicals who had aided him much as dream aided in the beginning of his career. I watched as a smaller channel, the franchise came to the assistance of technicals, much as someone like Pie Man would have come to John's aid years ago. It was at that point I realized this is the true John Swan. John was never the hero that he made us believe he wasn't the victim of a misstep and fear john swan in my honest opinion was a sociopath unfeeling for his fellow man uncaring for the topics he discussed looking into his cold stare i finally realized john would stab anyone in the back just to taste his former glory in my opinion he's a monster And doing all this, I have to come to a conclusion. John by far is one of the most talented creators I have ever seen. In fact, I may never have felt the desire to create this had it not been for him. But behind the slick edits and the smooth delivery, I can, can't see anything. I see a cold, lifeless being devoid of feeling and care. I wonder to myself, did this happen while we as viewers watched his ascension? Or was he always this callous? What I do know is I have seen enough to know I would never trust his word. And in commentary, that means everything. He has shown his hand and lost everything once. And paying attention to his latest controversy, he's going to lose it all again. I hope that I've been able to convey this message to you and seeing as this is the first time I've done this sort of media, 
Again, I want to reiterate the respect that I have for all of you that produced this. That being said, I'm Dan. And I'll see you when I see you.